Derek William Bentley. Bentley was 19 years old and intellectually impaired. He was high functioning, but uh, clearly unable to process information or language with the competence of a normal 19 year old. On the 2nd of November, 1952, Bentley and an accomplice named Christopher Craig tried to burgle a warehouse. Craig had brought with him a pistol as part of their kit. They were disturbed by a police officer and there was a standoff. The police officer demanded that Craig give him the gun. Bentley yelled out, let him have it. And Craig fired, wounding the police officer. Another police officer came to help and Craig shot him too, killing him instantly. Craig was 16 at the time and so could not suffer the death penalty, but Bentley was hanged as his accomplice at 19. Nearly 70 years later, we still don't know for sure what Bentley meant. When he said, let him have it, did he mean, Craig, give the officer your pistol like he's demanding? Or did he mean, let him have it, shoot him? You see, that's the awful, beautiful thing about our language. Words and phrases can bear more than one meaning. Words are almost never completely ambiguous. And even subtle rearrangements of words or punctuation can completely change the meaning of what we write. Unfortunately, the law is no different. So when you're reading a statute, how can you be 100% sure that the meaning you are giving to those words is the same as the meaning the drafter or the parliament intended? Well, that's the skill of statutory interpretation. G'day everyone, Anthony Maranak here. This video, the last one in Module 2, is a brief overview of statutory interpretation. Statutory interpretation gives us rules and principles which will never completely eliminate ambiguity, but hopefully give us much more certain ways to read the law. Now, there are a number of ways to approach this task. One common approach, particularly in the United States of America, is to say, well, here are the words, and they mean what they mean. That's a pretty limited and, frankly, in my view, pretty stupid approach, because as we've just shown, words hardly ever just simply mean what they mean. In Australia, the Parliament has actually written into the law in the Commonwealth and in the States, that when we read legislation, we should take what is called a purposive approach. That means when reading a statute, we should have in the back of our mind the question, what is this act trying to accomplish? What is the section trying to do? And we should read the words of the section as far as possible, in a way that is consistent with that purpose. Now, that doesn't mean we just get to ignore the words of the statute altogether, of course. We can't just say, oh well, this is the purpose of the legislation, so we'll go with that, regardless of what the actual words say. But when reading those words, don't you think it makes sense to have in our mind not only what the words say, but also what the Parliament was trying to achieve when it wrote them. The thing is, of course, that when we say that, we really open ourselves up to a whole new argument. Because how do we tell? How do we know exactly what the intention of the statute is? Especially if the statute itself is capable of bearing more than one meaning. Well, the law considers that there are a number of different guidelines available to help lawyers, the courts and members of the public to understand the intentions of a piece of legislation. 
Those are divided into intrinsic aids, which are found within the legislation itself, and extrinsic aids, which are found in other documents. As an expert lawyer, you'll need to be able to use both types of guides effectively. So let's have a look at them. Starting with the intrinsic materials, because we've met a lot of those in our previous video. Intrinsic materials are particularly powerful because they've all been passed by the Parliament itself and granted assent by the Crown. So they have every bit as much power as the words of the statute itself. The first intrinsic guideline that I want you to think about is the long title. Now remember from the last video, unfortunately, in this day and age, most long titles are really quite unhelpful. However, if you come across a good one, it will tell you right then and there what the overall intention of the legislation is. For example, the Australian Human Rights Act 1986, Commonwealth, has the following long title. An act to establish the Australian Human Rights Commission to make provision in relation to human rights and in relation to equal opportunity and employment and for related purposes. See how the long title tells you pretty much all you need to know? This is an act designed to protect human rights rather than to restrict them. It has a particular focus on equal opportunity and employment. And it establishes a new government body, the Australian Human Rights Commission, which is obviously going to have responsibilities in that area. Now, that won't necessarily tell you the reason for a specific section, of course, but if you know the purpose and intentions of the Act as a whole, that'll certainly help you to understand what contribution any specific section might be making to that overall purpose. The second thing to look for is a purposes or objects section. Now, these sections really only started creeping into our legislation after the purposive approach to statutory interpretation became dominant. Essentially, in these sections, the Parliament is saying to the lawyers and to the courts, look, we know that when you interpret this legislation, you're going to be thinking about what our intention was when we passed the Act. So to save you some trouble, we figured we might just write it down right here in the Act. It's helpful, don't you think? Let's have a look at a really great example now. The Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, 1999, Commonwealth. I love this Act, and not just because I helped work on its implementation. It has such a good purposes clause. First, it tells you the objects. Those are, A, to provide for the protection of the environment, especially those aspects of the environment that are matters of national environmental significance, and B, to promote ecologically sustainable development through the conservation and ecologically sustainable use of natural resources, and C, to promote the conservation of biodiversity, and D, to provide for the protection and conservation of heritage, E, to promote a cooperative approach to the protection and management of the environment involving governments, the community, landholders and indigenous people. And F, to assist in the cooperative implementation of Australia's international environmental responsibilities. And G, to recognise the role of indigenous people in the conservation and ecologically sustainable use of Australia's biodiversity. And H, to promote the use of indigenous people's knowledge of biodiversity with the involvement of and in cooperation with the owners of that knowledge. But then the Act goes even further and tells you in brief how the Act is going to do these things. You can read just that one section and still come away with a pretty good overview of this piece of legislation. And if you don't read that one section, well, I reckon you're going to struggle just a bit to understand any little piece of what is really a very large piece of legislation. Now, remember when we looked at the Enhancing Online Safety Act in the last video, we came across a couple of simplified outlines of the legislation? 
These are not quite as straightforward as purpose clauses because simplified outlines tell you more about what the act is trying to do rather than why the act is trying to do it or how it's meant to be accomplished. However, those sections, the, uh, perp the simplified outlines, are still very useful because they show you how the various pieces of the legislative puzzle fit together. They show you what each part or each division is trying to contribute to the overall goal. Again, that can be very helpful in determining the intended meaning of a specific section. The next one sounds too obvious to even mention. However, the dictionary or the interpretation section or the definitions section, they're all the same, in each act are obviously there to tell us how to read the legislation. They give us the specific meaning which the Parliament intended to attach to specific words. Now looking beyond the obvious, this is necessary for a couple of reasons. For one thing, legislation will often use technical terms which are very important in the area of being regulated, but which might not be immediately apparent to the average reader. Obviously it can be helpful to have those meanings pointed out. Perhaps more importantly though, some words have specific legal meanings. For example, in normal English, the word determine means to figure something out. So you say you're going to determine what the taxi fare will be, and that means you're going to figure it out. In legal writing, though, determine sometimes means finish or end. So if you determine a contract, or determine someone's appointment, or determine a license, doesn't mean you're figuring those things out. It means you're ending them or cancelling them. A definition in the Act can obviously be helpful here. Definitions in legislation also take on another form called an inclusive definition. This is where the definition doesn't actually tell you the meaning of a word. However, it gives you an indication of things that are included in the definition. Usually this is a non-exhaustive list, but it's almost always helpful in working out what the Parliament actually intended the word to mean. Incidentally, what happens if the Parliament doesn't define a word in the dictionary? Well, in that case, the word bears its standard English meaning. That used to mean its meaning in the Oxford English Dictionary, but nowadays many Australian courts rely on the Macquarie Dictionary. The final intrinsic guide that I want to mention is the headings. Each section has its own heading, and each division, and each part, and each chapter. Now, depending on whether the drafter was any good, those headings can sometimes be extremely helpful as guidelines to what the section is intended to mean. There are many examples of good, helpful section headings. I've opened, more or less at random, the research involving Human Embryos Act 2002. Section 11 you can see is headed Offence, Use of Embryo that is not an XSART embryo. Now I'm not familiar with that acronym. I'm going to guess that it means an assisted reproductive technology embryo, but the Act isn't going to keep me guessing because on that same contents page I can see there's a section called Meaning of XSART Embryo. Perfect. See how helpful a good section heading can be? Okay, so much for the intrinsic guidelines. What are the extrinsic guidelines and how can we use them? Extrinsic guidelines, as you might expect, are found outside the statute itself. That means that in most cases, the Parliament has not passed them. And so they don't have as much inherent strength as the intrinsic provisions. Having said that, their use does have statutory backing, and their contents often make them very helpful indeed. Let's start with the most helpful one of all, the explanatory memorandum. You might remember that we've come across the EM in video 2 of this module, where uh, we learned that the Minister tables the explanatory memorandum at the same time that the bill itself is being tabled, so during the first reading. We also learned that the explanatory memorandum is supposed to be a plain English version of the bill, 
Let's look a little more closely at explanatory memoranda and see what they can tell us. So first things first, how do we actually find an explanatory memorandum? Because it doesn't matter how useful the contents are if you can't get your hands on them. Honestly, it's really easy. You choose your jurisdiction, let's go with Western Australia, then you click WA legislation, and then down the bottom here we have WA Bill's Explanatory Memoranda. Then we go to the relevant letter, in this case W, and select our bill, the Workplace Reform Bill 2013. Click on that, and then over here we can download the PDF. Simple. Okay, what if the Federal Register of Legislation is more your style? Well, it's easy there too. From the main page, instead of selecting Acts, you select Bills, because remember, the explanatory memorandum was tabled when the legislation was still just a bill. Then we'll click EN for enhancing and scroll down. Here's our friendly bill. And just above it is the 2017 bill, which you might remember amended it. So we've got two explanatory memoranda we can look at. We start by clicking the bill, and then we click the explanatory memorandum link, and there it is. Easier than finding a decent cat video. Now, in case that's not enough, there is one more place you can find the explanatory memorandum, and that's on the Parliament's own website. We go onto the home page and click Bills. Now, it's just a tiny bit tricky for a moment because the Parliament's default search assumes you're looking for current legislation, and we're not. So, under Search All Bills, we select more options to muck about with the search settings. We unclick all of the current bills and instead click Royal Assent because we already know this bill was passed and assented to. We then select the 44th Parliament because the date ranges are right for our bill, which was introduced in 2014. We stick Enhancing in as our keyword and there's our bill in the results. We can just click Explanatory Memorandum and go straight to it. Not quite as simple as the others, but uh, now you've got three separate research strategies under your belt. Cool, huh? Okay, we've got our explanatory memorandum. Let's open it up and see what's inside. The first thing the EM does is to give you a general outline of what the bill does and how it came to be. So straight away we read that this was an election commitment in the 2013 election. It then outlines in general terms the scheme that is going to be set in place. This is just about the perfect way to understand very quickly a complex piece of legislation. The EM then talks about how much all of this is going to cost to set up and then on an ongoing basis. Next, there's quite a long discussion about the bill's impacts on human rights. I bet you never knew that every piece of legislation that goes through the parliament has to be assessed and explained in terms of its impact on human rights. But isn't that awesome? Next, there's the regulation impact statement. This is quite long, but it really answers two questions. First, why do we need a new law? Is there some other way we can achieve the same thing without making new laws? And second, why is this law the best way to go? As we scroll through, you can see that this is really, really detailed. And most people will read most legislation without even bothering to open the explanatory memorandum. I mean, are they nuts? Finally, we get to the notes on clauses, where they go through every single section in the legislation one by one and explain why that section needs to be in there and what it's supposed to accomplish. Can you see how, if they're done well, the explanatory memoranda can be mind-bogglingly useful when it comes to understanding legislation? And yet a great many students and even a great many lawyers Read legislation without even once opening the EM. I mean, seriously, be smarter than that. Okay, the next extrinsic guideline I want to talk about is the second reading speech, which in some jurisdictions is called different things like the introductory speech. Remember the second reading speech? It's the speech given by the minister when they kick off the second reading debate. And the purpose of the second reading debate is to debate the policy or the reasons behind the bill. So the second reading speech is where the minister explains to the parliament 
what the government is trying to achieve with this legislation and how it's all supposed to work. Now, obviously, that's going to be pretty helpful when it comes to interpreting the legislation. However, there is a big however that you have to bear in mind when it comes to the second reading speech. You see, the second reading speech is always political in nature and it represents the political views of a political party. It's also made before the second reading debate and before the consideration in detail and before the other chamber gets to have a chop at the bill. So you need to be aware of the political realities of the second reading speech. It's often not going to be particularly fair and balanced and the bill might well have changed substantially by the time it's actually passed. Having said that, it is often the clearest and most straightforward outline of the government's intentions in passing the bill. It's therefore usually a good place to start. Okay, so how do we find one? Well, the process varies slightly from state to state, but if I show you how it's done in the Commonwealth, you should be able to fairly readily adapt that to your home jurisdiction. To find the second reading speech, we start out by taking exactly the same approach that we did to find the explanatory memorandum on the Parliament House website. We click on Bills, then muck about with the search terms to select the right Parliament and look for bills that have received royal assent, then stick in a search term to make life easier. We click the title to bring up the Bills page and then down here you can see the Minister's second reading speech. Easy peasy. The next thing I want to talk about is called the Acts Interpretation Act. How boring does that sound? Every state has an equivalent, although in some states it's just called the Interpretation Act. Now, I'm describing this as an extrinsic guide because it's not found in the Act itself, but this one's a bit different because it actually is an Act of Parliament, so it carries that level of strength. So what is the Acts Interpretation Act? Well. It's kind of like the master key that unlocks all other legislation. In fact, there's way more in the Acts Interpretation Act than I can possibly take you through right now. But here are a few highlights. And these are from the Commonwealth version of the Act. Section 2, capital G, talks about months. You see, months can be tricky because they're not all the same length. So let's say you've got a month to appeal a decision and that decision is made on January the 31st. Well, there is no February the 31st. So when is the month up? Well, this section sorts out that confusion. And the answer is you'd have until the end of February the 28th in most years or February 29 in leap years. Let's have a look at section 13. Section 13 makes it clear that things like headings are in fact part of the Act. They're not just helpful bits and pieces that are inserted into the Act but are separate from the provisions. They have the same strength as the provisions. They are a legislated part of the Act. Section 15, capital A, capital A, is one that we've already been talking about without you really knowing it. This section says really clearly that the courts should prefer an interpretation of legislation that would best achieve the purpose of the legislation. So this is where the law says you should be using a purposive approach to legislative interpretation. And then there's section 15, capital A, capital B, which is like a companion to that section. And it says that extrinsic material can be used to help interpret an act. So the rules that we've been talking about for this whole video, this is where they're found. Then there are some other interesting ones. Section 23 says that words referring to any gender are taken to also refer to any other gender. And that words which are singular are also taken to be plural. So if there was, for instance, a law that said you may not kill a person, you can't get out of it by killing two people and arguing, hey, but I didn't kill a person. Section 36, section 36 is really nifty. 
What if an act says that you need to respond to a government request within seven days after receiving that request? You received the request at 9am on Monday the 10th. So, is Monday the 10th day one out of seven? Or does the count start from the next day? Section 36 answers this question, the count starts from the next day. And a bunch of similar questions about how to calculate time for the purposes of the legislation. Section 37, capital A, is about birthdays. So we know you become an adult when you turn 18. Well, let's say that you were born at 8.07 on the 27th of December. When do you become 18? Is it 8.07 on the 27th of December, 18 years later? Or is it the start of the 27th? Or are you still a child on the 27th and you become an adult on the 28th? Well, Section 37, capital A, says you reach your new age every year at the start of your birthday. Cool, huh? This is just a smattering of the things that the Acts Interpretation Act does. It also includes definitions for a whole bunch of words commonly used in legislation. It includes other basic principles for reading and understanding legislation. Basically, despite its boring title, this is a colossally useful little act and you really ought to spend some time getting to know it. Next, let's talk about international instruments. These are things like agreements which Australia as a country enters into. They can be as simple as a specific agreement between Australia and one other country, or they can be as complex as a large United Nations treaty involving virtually every country in the world. Now, just because Australia signs a treaty doesn't make that treaty Australian law. Treaties can affect the law in Australia in two broad ways. The first is that sometimes the Parliament will take that international law and pass it as Australian law. If that happens, then it's obviously binding because it is the law. The second way is a bit more subtle, but we've already run into it once. Remember in the Enhancing Online Safety Act, there's a provision which tells the eSafety Commissioner to carry out their function with half an eye on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child? Well, it makes sense that in that case, when reading and interpreting the Enhancing Online Safety Act, we too should be referring to that convention. So if the government says that a piece of legislation is being implemented in order to carry out obligations which Australia has under a treaty, then the treaty itself becomes an extrinsic guide to understanding that legislation. So those are the extrinsic materials. There are others, but I'd say those are the key ones. So at this point, we've talked about the fact that when reading legislation, we look to the intention of the legislation rather than just the bare words. And that to find that intention, there are a range of helpful sources, both within the legislation, those are the intrinsic sources, and outside the legislation, the extrinsic sources. There are still just two more things to think about when it comes to reading legislation. The first involves a bunch of little sayings known as the canons of interpretation. No, not the sort of canons that fire cannonballs. These are some old traditional rules regarding how laws should be read. Now, it's important to understand that these rules are very old and they come from a time before the purposive approach to statutory interpretation was common. As a result, they were once much more useful and much more common than they are now. However, they do still get used, and it's still a good idea to know them. Let's look briefly at a few. The first one is nociter associus. This means that the meaning of a word is derived from its context. Now that's pretty much common sense and we do this in the English language every time we use a word that can have more than one meaning. So for instance the word park is sometimes a place where children play on the play equipment and families go for picnics. And park is also something that you do to a car when you've finished driving. If there is a sign that says do not park beside the road then the context tells us that they're banning vehicles from stopping. They're not banning play equipment. 
The next one is eustem generis. This one's quite nifty. It means that general matters are confined by specific matters. Okay, that's pretty meaningless, right? What it really means is that if a piece of legislation has a list and at the end of the list there's a kind of a catch-all, then the catch-all is limited to the things of the same type as the rest of the list. The usual example everyone gives is vehicles. So if a piece of legislation says that cars, trucks, buses and other vehicles are prohibited from a pedestrian mall during daylight hours, what would be meant by other vehicles. Would a baby carriage be counted as a vehicle? A pair of roller skates? A mobility scooter? A remote control car? Well, a usedom generis would suggest that we're talking about vehicles which carry people and which are normally driven on the road. So even though from one perspective you could say that a baby carriage, roller skates, mobility scooters and remote control cars could all be considered vehicles, a usedom generis suggests that they'd be okay to use in the pedestrian mall. Next, we have a pair of Latin maxims which you might come across and which mean virtually the same thing. Expressio unius est exclusio alterius and expressum facet cessare tacitum. They both mean loosely that the clear expression of one thing excludes those things which have not been expressed. Let me make that a little clearer. Let's say you have a piece of legislation that says an application may be made on the authorised form. Seems simple enough. Now let's say someone wanted to make their application on a dinner napkin or the back of an envelope. They might say, well hang on, that legislation doesn't say that I can't make my application on the back of an envelope. Well, expressio and expressum, they fix that up. Those principles make it clear that if the Parliament has clearly expressed one way of doing things, the effect of that is that they have excluded the other ways of doing things. Really, though, good drafting practice should sort this out. If the drafters had just written, an application must be made on the authorised form, then we wouldn't have a problem. The final Latin maxim that we'll consider is generalia specialibus non derogant. This one tells us that if general and specific provisions of legislation contradict one another, the more specific provisions are the ones which take precedence. So let's go back to our earlier example with the vehicles. Imagine that there were two provisions. The first is a general provision which says vehicles are not allowed in the pedestrian mall during daylight hours. The second is a specific provision which says emergency service vehicles are allowed in the pedestrian mall during daylight hours in the course of their duties. Now pretty clearly those provisions don't go together. I mean each of them contradicts the other because if emergency vehicles are allowed in then it's no longer the case that vehicles are not allowed in the mall, right? So generalia resolves this by telling us that the more specific provision takes precedence. So the result is vehicles are, pre vehicles are prohibited from the pedestrian mall unless they are emergency vehicles in the course of their duties. So those are the Latin maxims. Honestly, in this day and age, it's pretty rare to rely on them because modern drafters tend to draft legislation far more effectively uh, in a way that removes the need for these maxims. Gosh, we've covered a lot of material in this video. We're nearly done. I promise we're nearly done. But there are still a few more things I can tell you. Uh, which will help you to better understand the legislation that you'll be dealing with as a student. The next one I want to mention is called noting up. Now you've already learned that when the meaning of a provision is disputed, the most likely outcome is that the parties will end up sorting it out in court. So the court will look at the provision, it'll listen to arguments from both sides, and it'll decide what the provision means. And then it will usually publish that decision. Now, it makes sense, doesn't it, that if you want to know the meaning of that same provision, you're going to want to know if the court has already looked at it. I mean, if the court has already decided what a certain provision means, then in some ways the work is already done. You can go to that decision, read the provision, and know a whole lot more about its interpretation than you could ever guess on your own. 
So it's really important to find out if a provision has ever been considered by the court. We call this process noting up. Until you've noted a provision up, you can't be confident that you understand it properly. The quickest and easiest way to note up a provision is on Ostly. You open the provision you're interested in and you click note up. That runs a search throughout Ostley's database for any cases or any other statutes or any journal articles which mention our provision. The difficulty with this method of noting up is that it can be pretty indiscriminate. The search returns every case in which our provision has ever been mentioned. That doesn't necessarily mean that in each of those cases the court actually sat down and considered the meaning of the provision. Our provision might have been completely incidental to the dispute in most of those cases. So you can spend a long time working your way through the results to try to identify the cases that are actually useful to you. Okay, we're nearly at the end now. The last thing I want to talk about is delegated legislation. We've come across delegated legislation a few times in this module already. This is the bits and pieces legislation that's not actually made by the parliament, but rather is made by the public servants under the parliament's authority. Things like regulations. How do we read and interpret these? Well, in most cases, the process is going to be exactly the same as for the principal legislation. The second reading speech and explanatory memorandum for the main legislation will still be useful. And sometimes the regulations even get their own explanatory notes. So you read those regulations just as you would read the principal legislation. There are, however, two differences to be kept in mind. First, you need to consider the sunset provisions, which might affect legislation. What are these? Well, when the parliament itself makes law, the law is permanent. It stays in effect until the parliament changes it or repeals it. However, delegated legislation is a bit different. In most jurisdictions, delegated legislation has a lifespan of 10 years. After 10 years, the regulation automatically ceases to have effect, and the public servants have to consider all over again whether to make those regulations. So when looking at a regulation, it's doubly important to check the commencement date of the regulations. If the regulations commenced more than 10 years ago, they might not still be in effect. Second, you have to keep in mind that delegated legislation is just that, it's delegated. Let's go back to the Enhancing Online Safety Act 2015. You might remember from the last video that section 108 provides the authority for the minister to make delegated legislation. Now, if we look at that section again, we can see a couple of interesting things. First up, there isn't a general license to the minister to make whatever rules he or she wants. The rules must be required or permitted by the Act or else necessary or convenient for the Act to be effective. So if the minister decided to try to make legislative rules that had virtually nothing to do with the Act, then those rules could be challenged. Eh, that's pretty unlikely though. The second bit of Section 108 is a bit more restrictive. I've already mentioned it in the last video. The minister can't make delegated legislation which creates an offence or penalty, gives anyone the power of arrest, search or seizure, imposes a tax, spends public money or changes the act itself. So a regulation which did any of those things would therefore be invalid. What all of this means is that as part of interpreting delegated legislation, you need to actually confirm that the delegated legislation is within power, that it's not breaking any of the rules established by the Parliament. That means going back to the Principal Act and finding the equivalent of Section 108, the section which authorises the delegated legislation to be made. Now, I've got to say, 999 times out of 1,000, the delegated legislation will be within power and it'll be fine. But your client deserves for you to make the effort to check anyway. Well, so here we are at the end of Module 2. We've really covered a lot of ground in these four videos, but it's been worth it. Now, all of a sudden, you understand more about the Parliament than probably 90% of all Australians. You understand a lot about the process of making legislation.
which means that when you read an act, you're thinking about the process behind it, and not just the words on a screen. You've learned how to actually read that legislation, not just reading it as a document, but looking for all the extra clues and guidelines which will allow you to read it deeply. And finally, you've had a brief introduction to statutory interpretation. Here's the thing though. From this point forwards, you will fall into one of two categories of student. Some of you will take all this information and you'll apply it every single time you deal with a statute. And it'll take you longer to read statutes, but you'll get it right. And then there are those of you who will remember some or even most of this material without actually using it. I personally guarantee that if you're in the first group, the students who remember and use and apply this material, then you will be a more successful law student and a more successful lawyer. Now in module three, we're going to leave the parliament and statute behind for a while and focus on the other key source of law, courts and the authoritative cases that they pass. So at the end of module three, you'll have a strong overview of all the key sources of Australian law. Until then though, I suggest you go and grab a chocolate or something and reward yourself. You've earned it.